Thank you. All right, um, I'm Stephanie Jones. Um, I am an anesthesiologist by trade. I'm here to talk about all the questions you hate on the exam, the, that I wrote most of them. Um, I need to first acknowledge um, the late Dr. Mark Rosner, who actually is the authority on this subject. Um, he's also done a lot of great work with Tom Robinson in this field, uh, unfortunately passed away last year. When you think about the various devices that, sorry, I have to put my timer on. I'm in charge of two things. No problem. There we go. Let's try that again. Um, when you think about the various wires that we put in patients, certainly the most common are the cardiac implantable electronic devices, but there are lots of other things that are being put into your patients, including deep brain stimulators, spinal cord stems, vagal nerve stems, sacral nerve stems various implantable infusion pumps for pain management, as well as cochlear implants. We're gonna concentrate on the cardiac devices, but be aware that there are other things in your patients that are potentially uh, problematic when it comes to radiofrequency energy. And when we talk about the cardiac devices, we're specifically talking about pacemakers as well as implantable defibrillators, and we have to think about those a little bit differently when we're talking about the use of surgical energy. Lots of patients running around with these things. The geriatric population keeps increasing. And according to the Heart Rhythm Society, by uh, 2020, there will be about 670,000 defibrillators and about 70, 750,000 pacemakers are implanted in the US every year. Lots of sources of electromagnetic interference available in the OR monopolar electrosurgical devices, as well as, well as endoscopic devices. RFA that we just talked about, as well as the various monitors, fluid warmers, radiologic uh, devices, and the nerve stimulators. What factors determine the effects of EMI on your cardiac devices? One is the intensity of the field or the source. So the example that Pascal just talked about, where you're doing an RFA, you need those two dispersion pads. That's a good clue. There's a lot of energy running through that patient. The frequency and waveform of the signal, we'll talk a little bit again about cut and coag, I know you all are thrilled about that. Um, the distance between the source and your leads of your cardiac device, and the orientation of the leads with respect to the device. What bad things can happen? Now let me back this up a little by saying most modern devices are very durable when it comes to dealing with EMI. Um, but it's still something you need to keep in mind, and we'll talk a little bit in the last couple of slides on the take home of when do you really need to be concerned. The most common thing is going to be inappropriate inhibition or triggering of a pacemaker or defibrillator. It's seeing this electricity, it's thinking it's some sort of cardiac signal, and this can include a shock with an ICD. So, you, you know, this, you want to have some self protection here as well. Um, you can have unintended asynchronous pacing. And by asynchronous, we mean that you're doing, you're pacing no matter what the patient's inherent rhythm is. Very rare with more recent models, but conceivable is reprogramming of devices, which is um, a problem, um, obviously, but thankfully not too common these days. You can have damage to electrical components if you're close enough to the wires, as we talked about when you look at things, you know, if you're more than or less than a couple millimeters away, that can definitely be an issue. You can, by the same token, conduct electricity through those wires and perhaps induce an arrhythmia. And you can have thermal injury at the lead tissue interface. And if you scar that cardiac tissue, you can affect your pacing threshold and potentially deactivate the pacemaker in that fashion. What do you need to know about your patient's um, cardiac device? First of all, do they have one? History and physical are important. If they do, most of them should carry an ID card of some sort on them. Um, a chest X-ray can actually reveal some identifying marks on the device if the card's not available. What anesthesia tends to be concerned about when we're talking about pacemakers is, is the patient pacemaker dependent? Or do they have some sort of third degree heart block or some other arrhythmia or conduction defect where if they stop pacing, it will be a problem. Um, you want your EP lab, to hopefully, or their cardiologist to be able to tell you this, and ideally to have it interrogated sometime in the recent past so that you know exactly what is going on with it. Um, you don't really need to know this. These are the codes that you will see on um, pacing programming. What you need to understand is when we're talking about the codes that you see, it's what chambers are paced, which are sensed, so what 
is being looking for native signal, what's the response to the sensing, and then there's some extra, there's a fourth column that you don't see too much, which is rate modulation for some of the devices that will actually change the rate depending on exercise and other things, and multi-site pacing. So when we talk about asynchronous pacing, we're talking about both of these being zero, okay? So you're gonna pace either the atrium ventricle or both, but you're gonna continue to do that. Um, most patients, or many patients, if they have otherwise decent conduction, are going to have some sort of sensoring and sensing and response modes where they're either going to be inhibited if it's sensing native rhythm or uh, triggered if it's not. So again, this is important only because when we want to reprogram something to prevent loss of pacemaking, um, this is what we talk about putting somebody into VOO or DOO. So first of all, does it even matter? Part of that's gonna depend on what instrument you're using for your case. If you're going to use a bipolar or an ultrasonic, it's almost irrelevant unless you're literally on top of the pacemaker. So that's great. So we will often ask if you can do that if you're gonna be near the pacemaker. Unblended cut is better than blend, which is better than coag. And think back to the first talk in that graph of the nice little sine wave versus the burst of high energy. Again, high energy is going to have more an effect, right? Um, the nice even sine wave is easier for these devices to filter out and know that it is artifact versus these sudden bursts of activity. If the patient is pacemaker dependent, then you do want to consider getting that reprogrammed to an asynchronous mode. We'll talk a little bit about magnets. Most magnets, when put on a pacemaker, will place that pacemaker into an asynchronous mode. That's not guaranteed. Again, in the ideal world, every hospital would have a cardiologist or a um, pacemaker representative or somebody else that could actually interrogate and physically reprogram. That's not real life. Um, and even in our place where we have an active EP service, they'll often say, just put a magnet on it. Um, the risk of doing asynchronous pacing is if you get an R on T phenomenon. So you're pacing on top of a T wave and you can actually put yourself into, or put your patient, not yourself, afterwards yourself, into this uh, lovely, yeah, exactly, um, into a uh, potentially lethal arrhythmia. So something to keep in mind. Rate adaptive functions, I mentioned earlier, they tend to respond to bioimpedance of the chest. So if you have a a uh, patient with a rate adaptive function, you sometimes want to suspend those because um, it can result in some unpredictability of an increase in rate during the case. ICDs, you really do want to suspend the antitachyrhythmic functions if you're going to be operating anywhere where the current could potentially affect it because you do obviously don't want to deliver a shock during the procedure. If you do disable that, you want to make sure that you have a defibrillator somewhere where you know where it is near the patient. And again, depending on why that patient has the ICD, if they have had repeated episodes of VFib or VTAC, you might even want to put pads on the patient preemptively so that they're there to connect if you need it. Magnets, we talked a little bit again. It, again, this is sort of, I hate saying, you know, absolutely never use a magnet because we do it so often. Um, but it typically will give you an asynchronous mode. Um, it may be affected by remaining battery life. If you ha it, the rate that is resulting from putting the magnet on will sometimes differ because it's used as a signal that the pacemaker is running lower on battery. So it might be 60 normally and 100 when it's on low battery. And most of your patients who have a pacemaker, we probably don't want the heart rate at 100. If you put a magnet on an ICD, that also has a pacemaker function, it typically doesn't alter the pacemaker, it only turns off the ICD. So that's when you, again, you really kind of do need somebody who can physically reprogram the device rather than just putting a magnet on it. And there were a couple case reports of, even when the magnet was taken off, that the ICD function did not reactivate. Again, those are old case reports, and I have not heard of anything like that since. For monitoring, you want it to be continuous, that's normal per ASA standards anyway. But the key is you want something that shows perfusion. For most patients, that's going to be a pulse oximetry pleth, where we can see the waveform. 
um, or an A-line. If you have an arterial line, that's easy as well because the EKG is obviously going to be affected by the, uh, the EKG signal is going to be affected by the electricity. And you can see here is a good example. This is an art line where somebody's using some sort of monopolar instrument. You get nice noise on your EKG. Well, it also turns out you've completely inhibited your pacemaker and have no pulse right now. So unless you have a perfusion monitor, you're not going to necessarily know this is going on. Monopolar devices are the ones we don't like because they have the most radiofrequency energy um, and you're putting it through the body. Remember the picture of it going through to the dispersion plate? You want to position that dispersion plate such that the current is not crossing your device. So just because we always put it on the thigh, that may not be the place for some surgery depending on where you're working. If you're working on the shoulder, pacemaker, thigh, you're going right through. So think about where these things are going. You want to keep it as far away from the generator and leads as possible. This is um, important. There's probably a question on this. Once you get about uh, below the umbilicus for surgery, like if you're doing a hernia on an elderly gentleman with a pacemaker, you're probably fine. You're far enough away from the generator and the leads. And so that tends to be the landmark that people use is about the umbilicus. Um, you know, that being said, it's still risk benefit, making sure that the patient's going to do okay if that pacemaker is not functioning and you want to be able to monitor while you're working with your device to make sure that nothing's going on. So just illustration of the same thing, try not to have your theoretical electricity path crossing through your heart and leads. Oh, and I just drew that in as my umbilical line there. Um, other things that are, make it better for the patient with a cardiac device don't arc. So when they talked earlier about that nice vapor path, um, that's creating more energy, right? Use short intermittent bursts. I put the asterisk there because I have a cute case study next that I'll just show you real quickly. Use cut preferentially over coag if it makes sense for your surgery. Again, if you need to use coag, use it, but keep in mind what else is going on. And use the lowest feasible energy levels. Don't go up to lightsaber levels if you don't have to. RFA, as we discussed, um, really be careful about where you're putting those dispersion pads. It is a lot of energy for a long time. Um, and if anything, patients who are getting an RFA may be even more likely to have these devices because that's why they're not having surgery, right? They're sick. Um, and you're, as I said, more, more AMI because you're doing the energy application for long intervals. Anybody who works in the endoscopic suite here, um, lots of the devices that are in common use are monopolar. The various snares, hot forceps, ERC, P-tomes, um, APC devices, Endoscopic balloon array and endoscopic submucosal dissection knives are all um, monopolar. Again, probably not a big deal if you're working down in the bowel, but think about if you're working somewhere in the uh, esophagus or stomach where you are in proximity to your heart. And this was actually what I was talking about with, quickly with the uh, short bursts where this is an ICD and this is noise from the um, ESU, and it's thinking, okay, I think that's VFib. This is the machine thinking this. It's now charging, and if nothing else happened, it would just, the charge would be dissipated. It wouldn't release the charge, but then the ESU was fired again with a short burst, so it's thinking, oh, this is, this is VFib. This is bad, and actually shocked the patient. So as much as we want to say short bursts are better, it can sometimes still be misinterpreted by the device. Um, oh, this was, um, I added this last year where there was this a nice case study of the new wands looking with the radio frequency tagged um, gauzes. Um, they actually have a nice picture of, it was, granted it was with temporary pacing wires in a cardiac patient, so they're very close to the skin, um, and they actually were able to inhibit the pacemaker with the wand, so... Keep in mind, there's other things that cause problems in the OR. 
Later, afterwards, you want to ideally interrogate the device to make sure everything's okay and that function's been restored. And if you have a high-risk patient, you really should keep them continuously monitored until you can get that device checked. And this, again, applies mostly to your ICD patients and, and people who are truly pacemaker um, dependent. So your take-homes, know if your patient has a device, know if they are pacemaker dependent and if they have an ICD. Make, you know, think sensibly about what sort of electrosurgical device you want to use. Note your current path. If you can avoid using a monopolar device, do so. If you can't, plan for that and make sure that you have the device examined postoperatively. And that's all I have.